I am uh, honored to be with uh, Ms. Jane Goodall, uh, steam primatologist, ethologist, anthropologist, um, who of course has done groundbreaking um, work revealing to us the behavior of uh, wild chimpanzees and uh, then um, sort of nonstop work um, on behalf of your institute and conservation. It's really an honor <laughs> for me to finally meet you and be able to talk. I mean, we're at a stage now where, you know, wild chimps are probably more endangered, I guess, would you agree, than, than ever? Uh, and yet the likes of Steve Wise, who I wrote about recently, and you were on the Non-Human Rights Project board, you know, is petitioning for personhood for a chimpanzee. So where are we? Where are we at, at this state in time in, in, in our relationship with wild well, animals like chimps? The, the big problem with the chimpanzees is that they're vanishing in the wild. I mean, when I began in 60, there were probably closer to 2 million than 1 million. I mean, there were chimpanzees right across Africa in that equatorial forest belt. And today, 300,000 is max, and they are, many of them, in small, isolated, fragmented patches of forest. They have no chance for long-term survival. So their, their future is in jeopardy, mm -hmm. and they're being threatened by deforestation, by the uh, bushmeat trade, and also by the live animal trade, which was, I would say, 10 years ago, we thought we'd stamped it out. Mm -hmm. But now it seems to have come back, and the Young chimps are coming, as I say, to the to the Middle East, but also to China. I was going to bring up China, uh, n not to villainize one nation, but I mean, it, it's not news that uh, you know uh, they're trading in rhino horns, they're carving ivory, they're airlifting baby elephants to their zoos. Still, I mean, uh, that's emblematic of this. What you're saying that this this live trade is still going on. What what's what to do? What's to be done? Well, we just have to work on reinforcing laws. We have to work to to educate people better. Uh, we have to work on the demand end, but we also have to work on the on the, on the legislation on the supply end of it. One of my ways of tackling these things is through the young people, uh, and that's our Roots and Shoots program, which is now in 140 countries with young people of all ages, from preschool right through university. And the thing is that when you get young people are very passionate about issues, they're influencing their parents and their grandparents. So, in, you know, in, in the context of a, the kind of realistically bleak situation that you've described, I mean, not now they're increasingly in these non-contiguous, isolated pockets around Africa, numbers drastically down, going down. I mean, is, does your optimism, I'm assuming you have some optimism derived from that kind of activity with the with the younger people in the world in, in that form of education? Or Well, the chimpanzee situation is such that it didn't dawn on me mm. how shocking it was until it was the early 90s and I was in a small plane. I flew over the little Gombe National Park mm. you know, where I've done the chimpanzees now since 1960 and the surrounding country. And I was absolutely shocked because there was going to be a little oasis of forest surrounded by completely bare, I mean, totally bare hills, which had been forest. Hmm. And that's when I realized there were more people living there than the land could support. So that led us, us being the Jane Goodall Institute, into a program we call Take Care of Dakari which is working. It started off with the 12 villages around the Gombe National Park. We're now in 52 villages, moving right out, moving down south where there's still intact forest with chimps. And uh, the, the people, because they've tr they now trust us. Yes. And because we brought money in for microcredit loans, um, education for the children, working with, with women, working with health, and they themselves have put land aside. And so everything is turning back. We're going back to how it used to be. Some semblance of how it so used to be. So if this isn't hope, I don't know what is. I'm presently uh, dashing back to my office to finish closing the story this week from the New York Times Magazine, but it's about this incredible sanctuary, I wonder if you know it, out in um, Los Angeles, where a woman is pairing uh, traumatized parrots, uh, pet parrots, former pets, with traumatized war veterans. 
and the two are healing one another just through mm. daily contact and exchanging. But it underscores so much of what you've opened the door to our understanding of, which is this empathic connection across species, not just with one another. So is that evolving more among humans? Do you think that they're learning more um, about the empathic connection? Well, is that we, certainly, we certainly can. Hmm. It's something we probably lost and we're maybe getting back. Yeah. When you talk about parrots, you know, there is so much we have to learn about the animal kingdom. And this one parrot I know has just said is 1,000, I think it's 570th word, 1,570 <laughs> words. Word in his vocabulary is only counted if he said it a couple of times unsolicited in the right context. That when his, his partner, <laughs> uh, she's not a scientist, she's a, she's a jeweler, but she has been talking to him ever since he was three months old every day, as a, never teaching him, but just talking as though he's a child. And when her pet iguana died and she was all upset and she had a, she had a, a box on the ground, she was going to give him a burial, she had candles and, and Kisi the parrot comes and has a look. And so he took one look at this dead iguana and he said, try a new battery then. <laughs> I, I've got to put that in my story. <laughs> How about that? I really appreciate this. It's, it's, it's been you know, really great to finally catch up with you in person. So thanks so much for doing it. Thanks and good luck. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>